This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. As we head into Christmas, a little blast from the past. Two trading super pros. Now, there's a lot of super pros on this podcast, so I shouldn't just call these two guys only super pros, but they are. Jean-Philippe Bouchot and Toby Crable, both systematic guys, both quant guys. One trend following, the other short-term systematic. If you can't learn something, from Jean-Philippe Bouchot and Toby Crable, you got something wrong with you. Your mind don't work right. Without any further delay and no rambling from me, let's jump right into Jean-Philippe Bouchot and Toby Crable. I hope you enjoy. Today on the show, I have Dr. Jean-Philippe Bouchot. He is chairman of a multi-strategy quantitative hedge fund called Capital Fund Management. He's co-supervisor of the research team. He is a well-known authority in the field of econ physics and a co-author of Theory of Financial Risks and Derivative Pricing. He's a professor of École Polytechnique, where he teaches complex systems. He is a member of the European initiative called Crisis standing for the Complexity Research Initiative for Systemic Instabilities. And he holds a PhD in theoretical physics from École Normale Supérieure. I hope you enjoy this conversation. So I want you to elaborate on your physics background, but bring that into... This, this framework of classical economics, classical economics, you know, the rationality of economic agents, the supposed rationality, the invisible hand, market efficiency. But for, for some reason, uh, the, the idea of empirical data often gets left out of the equation. And I think, and I've seen this with some other uh, traders that have had success, a physics background uh, is different. It, it allows you to maybe look at the world through a wider lens. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm surprised that you say all of this because that's, that's more or less what my usual message is and, and you've captured it all in a, in a few words. Yeah, it, it is true that, you know, I'm a physicist by training and, and physics is, of course, learning through doing experiments and, and you learn that theories are no good if they're not able to reproduce observations. And even if your theory is beautiful, if it, it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit and too bad and you just have to throw it in the dustbin and, and start again. So, um, so I, as a physicist approaching fin- economics and finance back in the early 90s, that's what struck me most is that there's, it, it, there's a philosophical aspect to the way economics and finance theories are built very much axiomatic and, and imagining how the world could be or should be um, and and then you know developing the theories without much care about what's going on out there so I, I guess that for a while it was justified to do that because data was not so easy uh, to to access so the whole academic world has developed uh, without data in a sense and so people had to Maybe supplement the lack of data by uh, by axioms and by ways of thinking that that can happen too in physics actually. But uh, so perhaps I was fortunate enough to enter the field when data became uh, very easy to access and and you know when looking at data and trying to make sense of data uh, through a, a kind of vivid light on on the failures and drawbacks of efficient market theory and, and you know, Gaussian statistics, black holes, all this, uh, to me, uh, was uh, quite, 
had apparent that it was um, it was not enough to understand the world. But you know, you mentioned uh, Black Scholes model; uh, it's still in use. So e even even though that systematic underestimation of risk uh, is well known by people like yourself, uh, it's still in use. Yeah, I know. I've been ranting about that for <laughs> ages, and and uh, one problem is is. You know, students, you have to teach students something, and Black Scholes is so easy to teach, and, and it's so beautiful mathematically that, that a lot of, of people just resent the idea of having to put it all down and, and start again with something more messy. Uh, of course, the world is messy, and it's, it, being messy, it's much harder to, to, to teach, you know, to focus on the right things, and, uh, by definition, you have to form your intuition on something else than mathematics. And I think that's why physics is good at that, because it, it gives you a, a lot of examples where you can put your hand in, in the dirt and, and, and try to you know, push on, on some button and see what happens. But I think the same should be more and more true with uh, economics and finance now through two channels. One is the availability of data and the possibility to make experiments on data, uh, simulations, that is, and, and with, even without data, you can do simulations. You can in invent worlds of you know, people trading according to certain rules or firms producing uh, according to certain rules and implement whatever rule of thumb or, or feature of the world that you think should be there and then just run the simulation and see what happens. And then what's very striking when you do that, uh, first it's fun because you kind of play God. And second, very quickly you realize that some of the rules just don't work. They don't, don't represent at all what is seen uh, out there. And others seem to capture something that's very close to reality. And, and so my impression is that by training people more and more with this type of background, this type of experimental background, in a, in a strange sense, because experimenting with simulation is, is a strange notion, which actually, even in physics, it took a little time for people to accept that simulation was uh, a, a legitimate way to do science. Um, I, I don't know if you know Mark Buchanan. He's a science, science writer, and he wrote a few years back uh, something on, on numerical simulation, which I like a lot. So if you give me one minute, I'll... I'll find the the exact um, uh, quotation because I uh, sure. uh, I think he's he's uh, spotted spotted it right uh, with his own well. Okay, so I have it. Um, so Mark Buchanan in uh, an article op-ed I think it was in the New York New York Times just after the crisis in uh, October two thousand eight said the following, done properly, computer simulation represents a kind of telescope for the mind, multiplying human powers of analysis and insight, just as a telescope does our powers of vision. vision. With simulations, we can discover relationships that the unaided human mind, even with the human mind aided with the best mathematical analysis, would never grasp. And, and for me, you know, this is, this is the essence of, of what the physics way of doing things has, has brought to the game. Just so people don't think that perhaps you're giving an interesting uh, marketing story about a physics background for your, your trading firm, your firm does not hire traders. Am, am I correct? Yeah, it only hires physicists. And, and you know, uh, okay, people can think that, but we've been saying the exact same thing since the mid-90s when we started. And I know for a fact, for two reasons, well, First of all, because the everyday life of CFM is driven by data, is, is you know banging our heads against data and trying to make sense of what we see and make models inspired by what we see. And the second thing, which shows that it's not you know pure marketing, is that I think we're uh, very strange as a trading firm to have published something like a hundred scientific papers in the last twenty years. Uh, all published in academic uh, journals, which shows that it's it's really in our DNA to consider science as as the right way to do things, if you want. Well, let's jump right into my primary reason for reaching out to you today, which was seeing your paper, which really didn't have any big fanfare, just kind of all of a sudden appeared 
in the internet ether and uh, two centuries of trend following. And I wonder if you might uh, lay out a scenario for how that paper came to be, and then we can discuss some of the specifics inside it. Okay, so as I said, we've been publishing papers for, for 20 years now, uh, and, and this particular paper was on the back of our mind for a long time. Uh, there are two reasons for it to appear right now. One may fall in, in what you call marketing, which is that we're launching, uh, we've been launching in, in January this year, a fund called Institutional Systematic Diversified, and a part of that fund is based on long-term trend following. Uh, so it is true that we needed to give some support to why we're doing that. And the second thing is that we recently, in the course of the la very last few years, uh, had, access, have, uh, had access to much longer time series than we had in the past. And in particular, we've been able to go back to uh, you know, beginning of, of, of the 19th century on uh, commodities and indices in terms of data. And so this allowed us to backtest uh, quite a number of ideas, and in particular trend following. And in a sense, to our surprise, we realized uh, that uh, the strategy has been extremely consistent since, well, as long as we could go back in the past. And, and this seemed to us to be a very uh, interesting finding uh, on the year where the Nobel Prize is given to to Fama uh, and Schiller uh, and, and Hansen as well. But uh, this debate on, on the efficient market hypothesis, uh, on which I've been uh, pretty vocal myself in the last uh, 10 years, I think it's, you know, it, it is ironic that uh, that it's given to to Fama, who's uh, still arguing that there's no bubble, there's no crashes, that uh, the market went down in 2008 in anticipation of, of, of the crisis and not uh, the other way around, and that everything is, you know, is perfect. And, uh, and trend following, momentum in general, is something that efficient market theorists uh, have a real difficulty to explain because that that's completely out of the framework. I mean, you, it's very hard to evoke some kind of risk premium that would be associated with uh, with trend following. So it has to mean that markets are not that efficient. There's a, a lot of other um, uh, clear uh, discrepancies between theories and, and, and reality, but I think this one is is a very genuine and, and clear one which talks to everybody. I mean, if look, just looking at the um, trend on the on the on the long time scale is giving information on the future motion of the market, then it really means that all the inf all the public information is not included in the right in in the price right now. So for me, it's it's both from an intellectual and commercial point of view, uh, a very interesting finding. I thought the the statement that jumped out at me was. And this is from your paper, quote, the existence of trends is one of the most statistically significant anomalies in financial markets, end quote. And that's a, that's a powerful statement. Well, you know, we've been looking at financial markets in the last 20 years, and it's very hard to find extremely significant statistical effects. You can find them on the high frequency side. But then there's a lot of uh, murky things around high frequency. First of all, you know, costs are, are tremendous uh, if you want to trade uh, at high frequency. So it's not clear that all the high frequency anomalies that have a strong statistical signature are, as economists would say, uh, very relevant from an economics point of view. On the other hand, these very slow trends uh, where a lot of money can pile in and has piled in is, is of course, much more um, mind-boggling in a way and, and also has to be uh, taken into account both for academics but also for, from, uh, from the point of view of professionals. You know, a couple of the other interesting facts that I thought in the paper, it, perhaps this is obvious if data is going back to the 18, early 1800s, but trend – predates trend following, which I thought was interesting. I think also, too, I think also too, and I'll let you expand on that and expand on this, is the idea that it's actually a very small percentage of traders employing trend following models that make up the volume. 
So the idea of trend predating, trend following, and that actually the traders using these models today make up a very small percentage of the volume. Yeah, I agree. Well, you know, you can see it both ways. I, I would rather say that uh, actors systematically implementing trends clearly is posterior to, to the existence of trends. But I would say that traders on aggregate using trends is probably the reason why trends are there in the first place. And people using trends have been around for, for 200 years. And, and that's, that's my interpretation of what we see is that there's a lot of people, of even small people who on aggregate uh, play the role of, of trend followers and therefore create these trends. You know, it's interesting. Also, you mentioned Fama and the split Nobel Prize. I had a chance to speak with Harry Markowitz recently, who's very lucid. And uh, the the point that I made with Harry uh, was, you know, Harry, did you find it interesting that when you wrote back in the 1950s, this is what we should be doing, that within a few decades, other other academics had taken what you said we should be doing and had said, this is what we are doing. And his response was, well, I think you're going to have to talk to the behavioral economists about that. He didn't want to touch it. But his point being is that, you know, I never said this is what it is. This is what we should be doing. And other people interpreted it uh, to come up with these, uh, as, as you might say, these these hard axioms that became uh, rules, uh, the, the, the foundation of the efficient market hypothesis. Yeah, it, it is a strange field in the sense that there's clearly interaction between what people do and what people observe. And, and the use of Black Scholes in 1987 is not a vivid example of how things can go wrong when, when wrong models uh, are used. That, 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 that's what makes the subject fascinating also for a physicist because you have to go kind of one step further and try to uh, understand how the models themselves might, might change the, the game. So actually, we, we came up with a with a simple model uh, on how you know trend could lead to trend or mean reversion could mean, lead to mean reversion, and a priori both are equally possible. I mean, you know, that it's not clear that we could imagine a world where people would follow mean reversion rather than trends. Uh, but it seems that humans have such a propensity to follow trends. Uh, there's a lot of, of very interesting psychological experiments where you can show that uh, you know, when, a, when a small child sees three points aligning on a line, uh, it gives him pleasure. So, so there's clearly, we're, we're wide in to extrapolate uh, past trends, uh, and, and that's probably a way to you know, extrapolate the motion of a tiger jumping on us or something that makes us uh, alive today. So, so my intuition is that it's, it's, it's much harder uh, to go against the trend than it is to follow the trend. And again, there's a lot of very interesting uh, psychological or even biological experiments showing that there's a lot of things, hormones going in and out our, our body uh, in the two situations, one when we're conforming to the crowd and other, the other when we're not conforming to the crowd. There, there's, a, there's a pain associated not not conforming to what's going on. Classical economics has no framework through which to understand wild markets. And wild is your phrasing. And I wonder if you could talk to the idea of classical economics not having the ability to have a framework to see those wild markets, to see through them. But how do you, how do you, when you use the word wild, what does that mean to you? Yeah, okay. So you're referring to a paper that I wrote in 2008 in Nature, uh, which was just after the unraveling of, of the crisis. And, and this made me react very strongly because I, I felt that this was, you know, in the cards. And, and of course, other people had seen it coming, but I was uh, not too happy with, with the way economists had been uh, kind of dismissing all the attempts to to introduce a little more um, wildness in the uh, description of economic systems and financial markets. So actually, wild is, is a reference to Mandelbrot. Mandelbrot has introduced uh, fractals, of course. He's introduced also the idea of uh, distributions without uh, a second moment, without variance, or infinite variance, or and distribution with infinite means. And and that's his classification of of randomness, if you want. So he would call 
benign randomness, the one that economists love, Gaussians and, and things where the average, uh, where you can replace a heterogeneous system uh, with its average. And we know, for example, uh, this, this relates to the book of Piketty as well, that the, you know, the distribution of, of anything in economics is so broadly distributed that very often it just doesn't make sense at all to, to replace uh, a collection of people by, by an average people, by a representative agent would be the, the classical uh, word. But coming back to Mandelbrot, uh, benign, benign randomness is, is the one uh, that I just described, whereas wild randomness is the one that is difficult to tame. And it's difficult to tame because it's, it's hard to speak about averages and variances. And so that's really what I was uh, referring to uh, when using the, the, the word wild. Now, why is economics in general not able to capture these uh, big swings? It's it's very strange. It's because the models are constructed to be intrinsically stable. It's like you know, people insist on the fact that a rational world is a, is a stable world, and so your model should be stable. And and so economics model come up with equilibrium points, which are intrinsically stable. That is, if you perturb them by a small amount, they're going to naturally go back to the to equilibrium. And and this is so much ingrained in the model that it's by definition impossible to have a crisis. And, and what's interesting is that when you remove a few of these rational assumptions and introduce market imperfections, then it's very easy to, to find situations where the, the rational equilibrium of economists, even if it still exists, is, is actually unstable. It's, it, and it's, it, it's perturbed by small external shocks in such a way that, that the system goes out of whack for a while, and this is what we would call a crisis. So I think that the mathematical apparatus is there to, to uh, allow us to not only uh, describe, but anticipate to some extent, or at least make space for crisis in, in the economic world. And for me, this is a this is a fascinating re uh, topic of research uh, on which we've been focusing in the last uh, few years. You know, I'll leave you with this, but I think the fun thing talking to you is you sound like you're having fun with this subject. You have fun with with what you do. You get to wake up every day and have fun. Yeah, exactly. That's that that's totally true, and I'm happy you say that. <laughs> it's not not much more to say, but you can just feel, I can feel it because it's 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 a big it's an it's an experiment to try and find empirical data to try and solve the puzzle to the best that you can, given that there's always going to be uncertainty. And I think what I have loved over the years talking to you, talking to you today, uh, many of your peers, is just that when when one accepts uncertainty, there's a certain honesty to it. And I think it, it's, it's, it's a lot of discomfort for me when, when people are so certain about what's going to happen. And so I, I just, I, I personally enjoy. But, but you know, I think that's, that, that's the, the big difference between uh, physicists and economists. And I think there's a lot to be written about this. And, I, you know, I, in a sense, I would say that we're privileged as physicists because we don't have to talk to politicians and we don't have to you know, make statements about how the world is supposed to work uh, in, in the sense that, you know, we, nobody's relying on us to, to make political decisions. And I think there's a huge amount of pressure on economists because they are under the spotlight. They, they have to come up with stories and decisions. And, and this means that it's not it's very hard for them to take a step back and say, okay, I'm really going to try to understand what's going on here. And maybe it's going to take me 10 years or 20 years, but at the end of the day, we'll have a better theory for the world. And, and I've been said that by, very, by many people who said, okay, well, all this is great, but what am I going to say to my uh, Ministry of, of Finance when he asks me about uh, should I raise tax or should I do this or that? And it's true that it puts people in a bad situation because they can't think long term. And as you've just said, as, as physicists by training, I think what we love is to, tr to be able to think that we understand something. And if we fail, well, it's okay. We, you know, we, it, it, 
there's nothing wrong in failing. It's uh, we know that the f physics has been has had so many revolutions and, and so many things that people were actually convinced were true turned out to be wrong in the end. So it, it's a, it's an incredibly good vaccine to against uh, what you said earlier about against certainty and, and, and a certain form of arrogance as well. I guess to some degree you're expecting failure, and maybe maybe some of the some of the economists don't want to uh, they, they they can't they can't acknowledge that there might be failure. Yeah, yeah, because the field is constructed completely differently for sociological reasons as well. Yeah. Hey, Jean, I appreciate you taking the time today. This was great, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And I I think the audience will enjoy uh, listening to your insights, and hopefully we can chat again in the future as as the wild. As Very happy to meet you someday. Of course, we've 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 liked your book, as you saw. It's it's actually referenced in our paper, and um, and and I'm very uh, happy to have been able to talk to you today. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. I appreciate it. It was good chatting. To find out more information, you can check out the Capital Fund Management website. Also, to see the trend following white paper we discussed, two centuries of trend following. Google will bring it right up. I first reached out to my guest today in 2005. It just struck me. And we talk about it in our conversation. Nine years ago. Damn. Time flies. Toby Crable is my guest today. Crable Capital Management. Short-term systematic trader. Quant. Very different than most of my world. Now, a lot of commonalities, price action driven, systems, models, risk management. But Toby is working on a whole different time frame, turning his portfolio over typically in less than a day. But I still remember our first meeting. It was a great conversation. And what struck me about Toby was his philosophical nature. The competitive sports side a former pro tennis player, but that philosophical nature and then executing it in the systematic trading world. I thought it was such a unique story then and today. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Toby, Mike Covell. Hi, Mike. How are you? Man, it's it's been a long time. I was thinking, I think it could be nine years since we spoke. I think that's right. I think it was in the, what, in the Virgin Islands, right? Yeah, I was like, wow, where's where's time go? That's really scary. <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> frightening. Okay. I just I just I just hope they they figure out this uh, life extension uh, soon before we uh, we we leave. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Interview uh, Ray Kurzweil. I think he's uh, he's after it. So. Yeah. So how's it going? Uh, it's okay. I keep working at it and and improving uh, a little bit incrementally, you know. And those little those little gains help help so that you know the farm's going well. My family's good, and uh, we fully moved out from Wisconsin, and it's a good life, you know. Playing a lot of tennis, and there's a lot of good things happening here. Let me jump into the setup of tennis, but first I want to describe a few big picture points. I want to drive right into what you just mentioned. So the head of Crable Capital, over a billion asset center management, since 1992, your track record starts, but not an overnight success story. And I would just checked on Amazon today to go to look at your book, uh, Day Trading with Short-Term Price Patterns, priced at $981 for a new copy. Mm, but, so low, so low. Oh, mm. <laughs> so, but here's where I want to go, though. Before all this, pro tennis player. I think you got as high as 280, or as low, I should say, uh, 280 in the world. Talk to me about though you, that that experience of being such a competitive tennis player. You know, the eight hours a day for years practicing. Is there a direct translation to the competitive drive that you have in the asset management field, the fund management field? 
Yeah, I think it's a direct translation, actually. I mean, I, I refer to it all the time. It's, it's, it's an analogy for for what I'm doing in the in my business and the way I approach things. So, you know, especially in those early years of the track record, but it's a good, it's a, it can be a good, a good training ground if you take, take away from it the idea that we can always get better and we can improve at what we're doing. And, and, you know, the one, the one thing that's, that's very clear is we, there's losing, there's losing days and there's losing, losing trades and there's losing tennis matches and how that's handled and what you take away from it is the most important thing. So that's, uh, that's, I think they, I think for me is the key to longevity and, and this, the solace that I, you know, I, I haven't always done that very well. I mean, in, in tennis, I, I think I stopped a little early. Uh, I had, I had looking at the record, I had a lot more potential than I, than I gave myself credit for. So one of the things I, I take away from that first career is that I'm not going to quit. So that's, that's one. I mean, there's been some tough times in these markets and in my own business, and I just don't. First of all, I don't want to destroy anything that I have by having too big a drawdown. So we're very conservative with risk, and I think that permeates the firm. And, and then secondly, uh, you know, when you're, you're there to, to fight for another day, you know, you, you don't you don't let yourself get overwhelmed by by the tough times, the losses, you know, the the day to day grind of it. You, you know, try to elevate a little bit and, and keep keep my head about me when it comes to that. I'm guessing from a tennis analogy, if if we're going to stay there for just a moment, you would probably prefer the consistency of a track record. If I pull up Wikipedia and I look at Federer versus a Nadal. Nadal is fantastic, but he doesn't have best that I can tell that the consistency is just it's Federer's in a completely different league. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I truly do admire of course both players, but Federer's oh it's just incredible talent. But the way he plays, there's a conservation there of energy, I think, that will allow him to play, I think probably we'll see a lot a lot longer than a lot of players. Uh, and there were others like that um, in the history of the game. I mean, uh, Ken Rosewall played into his 40s and did very, very well. Uh, it doesn't happen as much anymore, but, you know, there, I can think of Pancho Gonzalez was in his 40s when he, I think he did very well at Wimbledon one year. You know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're, I, I don't know if it's pacing yourself, but you just, uh, Nadal's passion is fantastic. You just mm-hmm. you have to love the intensity that he brings to the game, and there's really something really important about that when you see it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, when I think of my uh, my careers, especially this one, you know, I'm thinking I'm thinking lifelong. This is something that I really enjoy, and I'm 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 just fascinated by markets and price movement and and how to how to quantify that. You know, it's my science. It's what it's what I do. And there's hardly I mean, you can you can train in other sciences and that'll help, but it's it's you gotta really get in there and work with the work with the market data and use your imagination. So yeah, it's a this is a lifelong pursuit, uh, Mike, and I think that I, I don't think I'd have it any other way. I'm just I'm not going anywhere. Let me drive into this. So I wanna break apart the some trading aspects and uh details of how you approach the markets philosophically, et cetera. But I know when we talked years ago, you really thought that your space, and we were talking, we had a nice long conversation comparing your style of trading to trend following, uh, some of the quant trend following. And there were some commonalities, but your time frame was very different. And you painted a picture that you were in a pretty unique space, that you you didn't, you weren't, you were very humble about it, but you you were saying it was very difficult to compete with your strategies Whereas there might be, there definitely are, uh, many more trend-following traders out there and still to this day. So I'm curious, do you still feel like you have this unique space, your firm, and its multiple strategies? I think so in the money uh, money management world, you know, handling client capital, I think it is unique because you know, most of the shops that, and what I think our evolution is we're moving shorter and our holding periods are tending to be shorter. 
So well, that that lends itself to you know, there's a, there's only so much in the way of assets that you can manage, um, and there's a demand for it if you're if you're good at it. Um, so you, you have to be you have to be careful. Uh, and what happens is I think there's some very good proprietary firms that have evolved into relatively short-term trading like us or shorter. And the high frequency firms are certainly an example of this. I think that they're, they're primary, they're primarily or almost exclusively high frequency are, are prop firms. So they're using their own money and investing that and, and, uh, instead of trading client capital. And it's understandable because of the capacity constraints that exist in the short term area. But yes, this is, it is unique because in the, and it's certainly in the money management field, uh, there aren't a lot of, there aren't a lot of us, uh, I mean, what we do is we're trading primarily liquid instruments or a liquid product for clients. We, we trade frequently. We're, we're less than one day and our holding period, uh, on average. Is a lot of turnover in the portfolio. It costs a lot. It costs a lot to run the business. There's huge challenges in the execution area. So we, we really, it's not an area that I think is just not that because of the, the how pro, it's prohibitive to the, with the cost. There, it's just an expensive proposition. So there's not a lot of people that are are going into this. So, but you know, I came by it honestly. I did, I worked with a floor trader in the early '80s. And we had a joint account, and his 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 account, he paid no commission. So I was led led by the nose to be trading and to take profits intraday. That just stuck with me over the years. That that's just what appealed to me after after doing that. It, you're just kind of you just you kind of hooked. So yeah, it's a unique it is a unique area in the money management field for sure. There's plenty of prop firms though that do this. And those are our true competitors, I think, when we think of where we're, where we're at on the planet. It's uh, those prop firms that, that really stand out to us. You know, we spoke before, it was multiple diversified systems, applying them systematically across multiple different time frames. Where are you in your total number of systems these days? Yeah, it's, it's uh, you, know, you, can, you can talk about the systems individually, and there's there's... Oh, several thousand in the in the portfolio. Or you can talk about the ideas, which are broader conceptual frameworks that we work with. So, for, for instance, in my area of the portfolio that I uh, you know, I oversee the strategies in particular, there's I say there's probably twenty five conceptual frameworks that I'm that I'm working with there. And I think the rest of the portfolio managers in the firm think in the same way. So they have a broad conceptual framework and then they apply it in particular with a strategy and, a, and may even vary it slightly in the different, different markets, um, because markets are different. The, the universals apply throughout all markets, but there are particular aspects of each market that you, some you, you should probably take into account. So what I like to say is that, you know, the markets are, are the same in principle, but at the same time, they're different. So we're dealing with a, with, with two sort of different formulations of what, what markets are. Are they, do you optimize for each market? Um, um, well, not heavily, but yeah, you do make, you, there are variations for each market. And that may count as an individual strategy, you see. So that's, that's probably why the number is, is as high as it is. You would like your models working uh, across all markets, though. I mean, if, if that model works, you, you weren't it working at all markets. And when you're doing the testing, you, you want to see the uh, uh, you want to see it apply universally. I think across all markets without much variation, actually without any variation. So that that's step one. Um, after that, you may you may go in there and, and take a, a closer look at it. You know, because one one example. Clearly, is that there's a lunch hour in Asia, in, uh, in the Hang Seng. I think the Hang Seng. Yeah, Hang Seng takes off for like an hour, and they go to lunch. You know, if you're going to trade that, you have to you have to account for it. It's almost like a new opening in the second the second round uh, when they come back from lunch. It's uh, starting fresh. You know, back in the day when I wrote opening range breakout, I don't know if I took that into account. It may be something to take into account. 
have two openings a day in, in the Hang Seng market. Well, that's a unique sort of construct. You got you, you have to take those kind of things into consideration. But the general principles apply. That's certainly what I've seen and tried to adhere to is that because that's a more robust framework than when you're when you're building these these portfolios. There's, you know, there's not any clear cut statistics that tell you what it is you're supposed to be doing with a the strategy. There's just not that much insight in this in the stats. But what but what you do know is that if you can find something a widget that can be applied uh, in sort of a universal general way, then then you have something that's really really powerful. The phraseology you had used years ago with me was a kind of an assembly line thinking is what you were that automation and, and ha- being able to apply it uh, religiously. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, it's an appealing way of looking at it. It sometimes, it, sometimes it really, I, I think what it does is it keeps you, it keeps you honest uh, when you're applying these strategies. So that's very important. So Toby, when you're talking with clients or you get the random, uh, elevator pitch, but you probably don't get too many of those, but, uh, or you have to give the random elevator pitch. People want to know where did the profits come from for Crable Capital Management? So, you know, you've got counter trend strategies, you have momentum style strategies, you probably have others that I don't know about, but where philosophically do you see those profits coming from? Why are you able to extricate those profits from these liquid markets, liquid futures markets, et cetera? Well, I, I think when we're successful, what we're trying to do is find areas where it's very difficult for participants to to act. Places where there's market price action that aren't aren't comfortable places for a human being to to trade in the way that we're trading, and those seem to be the most profitable. And, and you know, if you if you're a discretionary trader and you're doing that, either you're rewiring your sort of innate psychological disposition in order to to do that sort of thing, or the, the fast track to this is to quantify it and then just let the machine do the do the work. Because, but over time, a discretionary trader going against his his, his nature. Fear, you know, uh, greed it will wear wear down because it is it's, it's, it's traumatic in a way, um, and that's that's but that's where the automation is a real help. You need you need in order to get an edge, you need to do something that essentially nobody else can feel comfortable doing. I mean, there's got to be some people, but you, you know, you're, you you may be the first, or you're very early on. So the recognition of that requires a little uh, getting ahead of it a little bit, you know, seeing seeing the market work itself into a position where it's 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 vulnerable to sort of weak thinking that can take place because we are we are vulnerable as humans. It may be too philosophical, but the the problem you can't you, you can't you don't want you don't want crowded trades. You you want to you want to be there. When it's very difficult for other other traders to to operate, and that's the that's sort of the wonder of systematic trading. I think it's a real benefit. But that said, we we tend to try to find the times when it's right to go against price action, and then, you know, as my early work would suggest, it, I also was looking for times when the market is ready to move directionally in any given you know day, and and isolate those environments. Uh, that's a that's an interesting area of work. Um, the markets are different at different points, and that has to be taken into account. You have to you have to. It's almost as if there's two separate, but there's more than that. There's there's many different environments, and but and our, our traditionally our portfolios have been separated into at least two primary areas of mean reversion and momentum. It's our job to find out when it's right to do that. You've not strayed from uh, price action. I mean, you are your firm is price action at its foundation. Yeah, and everything else that kind of goes along with that. I mean, volatility and volume, and you know, there's there's other, there's other factors I think that are are primary in that. But price action is a starting point. Price is a starting point. 
Uh, it makes it easy, too. I mean, you get a lot from just, just looking at price alone. There's a lot there. Talk about volatility since you bring it up. And I think everybody knows in the last the last month or two, we've, we've, uh, we've seen some significant volatility across the board. And volatility is something and, and a little bit of chaos, uh, a little bit of uh, markets starting to have that enthusiasm. That's not something uh, that's not a negative for your firm. Well, it depends. Um, there's winning and losing volatility. We prefer the winning volatility. Uh, at this point, you know, what we have seen is this, and it's, it's, it's changed a, a lot of things in our firm, uh, that up till, up till a few months ago, the volatility was at record lows in most of the markets. Foreign exchange market, the interest rate markets, even the stock market as it was rallying was on relatively narrow trade day to day. And, so the volatility, I mean, was, the VIX was at a very, very low level until just recently. But with the foreign exchange markets uh, perking up in the last couple of months, it's, it's uh, I mean, literally in most of the foreign exchange markets, euro currency, uh, dollar yen, you, you had the lowest volatility range that you've, I've, I've seen since I've started trading. And those were relatively good markets for us to trade in the past. If the volatility gets too low, there's no movement. There's nothing to really take advantage of. You need, you need, you need price movement. What's happened though is all of the markets starting with foreign exchange a couple months ago have, have changed. And the volatility has increased at least, at least, oh God, at least doubled, which is a welcome to what we're, what we need and, uh, for profitability. We need price movement. Now, the other thing, of course, we need is volume. And of concern is what happened in the last week or so with a lot of the markets when you had these very large price moves. The volume dried up significantly. And we haven't really seen that. That's a, that's a new phenomenon. I mean, it's sort of this, this early in a cycle of volatility. It's, this is sort of a unique circumstance, which leaves a question mark for me as we go forward and the, the thinking that we're doing about allocations and the kind of risk that we may have in the market. So that's a, that's another story, but, um, the volatility has increased. I'm, it took a long time. I don't think this is going away. As, as markets contract like they did for as long a period as they, they, they did, it's my opinion that they, the volatility cycle is on the, on the rise rather than declining in most markets. So something's up, in my opinion. I mean, economically, I can only, I don't know what that is. I, I, I do suspect that with the amount of intervention that's taken place in the markets over the years by some of the governments that the U.S. in particular, it, it's created a, it's created a, a circumstance that can be, can be very, it can end up being very volatile in my opinion. Let me interject real quick there because I think this is something central to your firm and we talked about this when we first spoke is the idea of shocks. And, you know, when these volatile situations start, we can think back to the summer of 07. It was almost foreshadowed what came into the, into 08. Now, of course, I'm not trying to make a prediction or anything. I'm just talking. But the idea of shocks, rubber band snaps, this is something you think about all the time. You're prepared for it. And you knew as a young man and you saw this happen to other people, you did not want your risk. You didn't want to risk your career on price shocks. Yeah, that's that's the truth. Well, we still have occasional bumps in the portfolio that uh, that certainly cause some sleepless nights. I mean, not, but look, I mean, I the clients have a certain appetite uh, for for drawdowns, and if you're within the range that they, you that you propose, and if you, if you can adhere to that, you're you're in good shape. You're doing what you you say you're going to do, and that's very very important when you're when you're you know enduring trust in a, in a in a program like ours. So, but yeah, price. I think we could say just in this last week uh, we've had something of a price shock. When you see every time you see those, you you, you understand where your weaknesses are thoroughly. So that has a that's an area of it. it it's a learning. It's a. It's a. If you're not, if you can continue trading through that, and you 
you're okay. You know, you haven't lost, had a huge drawdown or, you know, hurt your clients very badly. Uh, you've learned something. And there, there are things that you can put into place that will protect you further from these, these kind of things and these kind of events. And then, of course, you try to, uh, try to think, I think ahead at what, what can create real problems for the portfolio. But it takes a, a really, uh, thorough knowledge of what's in there and what, how the portfolios have evolved. And, you know, there's a lot of production going on in our, in our company, a lot of strategy development, and you have to stay on top of that and really understand what it is that people are are implementing in the portfolio, and uh, so to truly understand your risk. But that is it. That, look, if I'm building a 50-year track record, and I'm almost halfway there on this, which is you know a goal of mine, I, you have to you have to be able to get through those those, those price shocks. Those are the things that are lurking out there that can put you out, can thoroughly put you out of business. And I've seen, yeah, you're right. I have seen it before. I, I, it's, uh, it's, uh, it could be terrifying. You started your career as a guy with higher drawdowns, much higher drawdowns. Mm-hmm. So you've, mm-hmm. you've changed that. I mean, like a, a complete opposite side of the coin. I mean, you've gone from high drawdown to, I think I was looking today between a max of, let's say, 15 to 16% on your big portfolio. Yeah. And it's been a long time since we've seen that. That's a pretty big drawdown. I think we're right. We, we, that would be a big drawdown now. So, you know, hopefully our risk adjusted return is improving. But I, you know, when I was trading, uh, at the beginning, I, I, I wasn't thinking about portfolio management and I wasn't really tuned into, uh, what, what, a, what a client would, would want from a portfolio. So risk adjusted return has become, uh, the primary, uh, benchmark measurement for our, for our firm. So certainly we do want to have a consistent return, but we are a return, a decent return, but we also want to do it in a way that, uh, in a, in a less chaotic way, uh, than say the S and P, uh, in it's long, a uh, long only position in the S and P. We would think that we would be far, far better than that. Um, our drawdown should be less and our return should be higher or relatively speaking than, than a lot of or any intr- instruments out there. So we really want to be at the top of the risk adjusted to group uh, in the hedge fund world. I think you told me years ago it was, and you might be less today, but you, uh, two one hundredths of a percent risk per trade? Yeah, I think it is less actually because of the, because of the more, more strategies you have, the, the less you allocate to each one. But that's part of the risk reduction in itself. There's diversification and low correlation between strategies and the, and the more you can bring on that are truly not correlated. Um, uh, it seems like the better. I'd love to pick your brain just for a second and pretend this is like an audience question. So the, the, the trader out there, uh, the, the would be investor and, the, and they love their one market, perhaps they're only, they only fixate on one market, perhaps a currency or perhaps just one equity index. And then they, when they start to trade, they, they put these huge amounts of risk on. Maybe they could get 5 10 15%, perhaps more into this one market of their net worth. Why do you talk about, I mean, you've been testing systems and looking at these things for decades. Just give the big picture out of the gate why that's such a bad thing to do, to be fixated on the one market and to be extending yourself uh-huh. risk-wise. I mean, it's Everyone should know instinctively if you put if you start risking that a month, you, you can blow yourself out. A couple of losing trades and you're gone. I mean, you know, capital's not unlimited. Well, there's the allure of the profit too on the other side of that. So it's uh it could be quite appealing, you know, visions of change of life and quality of life with a if you can hit it on that that trade. Uh that's a problem. It's a there's a gambling element, gambling mentality that's that's leading that. But I think this is part of the evolution of any trader. When I started out, I traded, you know, you trade, you trade one market with one strategy. If that, you know, you, know, you, you, you have a partial strategy, undeveloped. So, but as you, as you, as I moved along, I, what I've done is I've broadened out that and tried to diversify through different markets and strategies. And we're still doing it. And I think we're trading 300 markets now, which is much more than I think when we last talked. Continue, that's 300 futures markets and foreign exchange. So 
you know, equities presents a whole area of diversification if you do it right for us. For the beginning trader, though, I mean, if, there, if you can imagine, a, say, a discretionary new trader, he doesn't have the knowledge base, he doesn't understand a lot of different strategies. He starts with one strategy. And I heard a quote from Richard Dennis. He, I think it was he. It was in one of the Market Wizards books that at the be- beginning of your career, you should be trading the smallest or the least amount of capital on the line, because that's when your knowledge is knowledge level is the lowest. And as you as you increase your knowledge base, you can increase your allocation. I think that that pretty much says it all. So to a new trader, this should what it should be. It should be a, a learning experiment at the at the outset. And if you're experimenting, you you don't do it with a a, a, a large amount of your capital. You do it with a, a very small amount, just maybe represented, or you, you don't do it with any capital. You just paper trade. But um, you evolve into a more complex uh, trader. By if you can stay, if you know, caveat on this is if you can stay in the game to learn. So you don't want to damage yourself. You know, there's a lot of people who just drop by the wayside because they just cannot handle the loss if it's too big. Those traumatizing losses can take you out of out of the game. And you, if you're not in the game, you can't learn. So you, you want you want to stay in. You want to stay in the game. You do not want to risk so much that it just totally traumatizes you. Was there a moment in your trading career where you felt like, wow, I'm at the point where I'm at the cliff and this could go drastically wrong? Or did you shift gears completely at some point in time and say, I'm just walking away from, we talked about having steeper drawdowns when you were younger. Is is there any kind of moment that you could think back to that kind of a revelation where you just said, wow, okay, I now know the direction. I, I see the space where I should be. I think that the when I when I went and worked at Victor Niederhofer's shop, it was very very clear to me. It was a sort of an integrating moment for me because I I could see the research platform that was uh, the best I'd ever seen, uh, bar none. And then it was it was a great team that I was working there, and he had, he had hired very very well. And uh, I was just uh, happier than could be to to have to be working there with with someone like Victor. Now Victor has different risk parameters on his trade. That's that's another story. But but as far as a researcher and a, a, a market philosopher, I've never seen anything like Victor Niederhofer. He's he's an amazing man. And um, and the fellows that work there, a lot of them I work with now. In fact, in my firm, I've, uh, we have six or seven uh, gentlemen that I had met back in the early '90s when I worked there. But whatever the ten or twelve years when I started in 1980 around the tra- uh, the floors of the exchange, when I got to Victor's twelve years later, I had a pool of market knowledge that I'd kind of developed the hard way and when I brought it into Victor's it just it just it sort of came together for me that's I felt I felt confident that I could do I could make something happen in the in the field uh, it, it wasn't that I wasn't profitable previously in the, in the 80s but it wasn't it wasn't as consistent as I would have liked might be a good time to interject just as a kind of a side note and I know this a little bit about uh, Victor's background too, enjoying the philosophy of, of objectivism. And I believe you do as well. Would you mind commenting on how that has affected your business life, your life in general, your entrepreneurial life? Uh, well, in the 80s, I think I was, I just, I, when I started trading, I, I just got off the tennis circuit. I played in Europe for a few years, played team tennis there. And, and, my philosophy, my view of life was a little bit different and I didn't really, objectivism, I I came across and uh, I came across what Atlas Shrugged in 1986 and read that, loved it 
what it did what it did for me was and this is the marvelous thing about uh, Rand's work is it provides a very clear cut moral code in fact the only one that i I've, I've really ever seen that that uh, supports what we do you know capitalist behavior the the capitalist system and so for an entrepreneur uh, like myself i i had to i really felt it was essential to it, looking back on it it was essential to have incorporated that in my in my life it changed it changed my thinking it justified my actions you know markets are very you know when you're around the exchanges you kind of you, you kind of look at your your fellow trader that to say some of the guys that came off the floor these are some rough and tumble fellows that were around the Chicago exchanges and and you know I, I almost there were times when I wondered whether this was really what my calling should be. In fact, a couple of times in the 80s, I went and interviewed for jobs as a, a tennis pro. And thank God I they didn't hire me because, <laughs> <laughs> because I may have I may have been doing that. Of course, I would have found out quickly enough that that probably wasn't what I wanted to do after all. You know, when I when I ran across Ayn Rand's work, it was an integrating moment for me also, and it it led me to Victor. Now, Victor has variations on his own position philosophically, and you know that's we all have a, our our different views of things. Essentially, he w- was a free market thinker, and he uh, we met because of a because of that. And plus, he was a racket guy, and he liked tennis players. So, and so that I. I went out and played tennis with him quite a bit at the beginning. It was a, it was, it was an entry along with my book. It was an entry into into Victor Niederhofer's world. But those are those are huge. I think very very important moments for me. Uh, yeah, I, I I I can't say enough about it. And it's still an important. You cannot. You you really can't justify. I don't think it's very hard to. There's a lot of confusion. I think philosophically and. You know, look at look at the regulatory groups out there, and the people clamoring the newest book on Flash Boys and the, the beatings that uh, traders are taking at, at just about any level. And you know, how do you how do you combat that uh, in any way without some sort of sound philosophical underpinning? Uh, and I think Rand's philosophy uh, provides that. It's a, an excellent moral code, in my my opinion. It's a it's a sane moral code. Let me add back uh, just one little bit on on Victor, and I think it's interesting that you know everyone can read the press accounts from the last fifteen years and whatnot, and and many of those ended up being negative. And of course, he runs a very popular site, and a lot of people contribute there. But I think what's interesting is how many notable traders cut their teeth there. I mean, his brother, for one, you. Uh, many sure. other many others that you can name off. So it's it's really interesting how many people uh, really gained a, a, a toehold and a foundation. You, know, you you could argue that you guys in some ways were another version of turtles, perhaps just a completely different setup. But I mean, there, there's a lot of people that came from being around him to have great success. Well, yeah, Richard Dennis, I think when he he had his experiment uh, on whether he could train traders out of you know, create traders out of nothing. He brought in the, the original turtles, and I think that, that was a, that was fascinating. The, the one commonality is that they're, they're quantitative. Victor was running a business. This this he was just he needed to hire people. And what happened is that he, it was a quantitative shop primarily. You know, you just you learn the ropes when you went in there. You were at the you, you know you work with the master. He he. Uh, he was a powerful intellect uh, when you worked with him. He he was a professorial. He he was uh, tough. He was he, <laughs> but it, it, he he was a real teacher. Now, Rich, the, the turtles. Are, I don't know. It's a, it was. A, I don't know much as much about that. But as far as the the fanfare around them, some I think some of those guys have done very very well. They have a lot of volatility in their portfolios. I. But they are generally all quantitative, and that's the that's the real similarity. I um, mean, you can teach quantitative work; it's it's uh, something that is transferable. I think uh, developing a portfolio is a little tougher. I know Victor never really taught portfolio development. 
I think Richard Dennis may have more with he I mean they diversified through many many markets uh, right at the, right at the, the outset and I think that that was some of the some of the portfolio work that that I do started with his allocation concepts that I you know I drew from the readings and some of the some of the turtles that did talk about it so they you know this basic basic allocation methods it, it's a good starting point when you're allocating to a lot of different markets but you know they let a lot I, I'm lucky because I met a lot of these fellows um, they Monroe trout was also a uh, came out of Niederhofer which is probably of any of any of the graduates that uh, he's the most successful and uh, we don't hear about him much anymore he's theoretically retired but he, he was he was brilliant and did a fantastic job of building a business hold on hold on hold on theoretically retired i don't know i don't know i i i, uh, I can't tell we'll leave, we'll leave that, it we'll know, leave it we'll leave it at that so anyway that he's he's a great example uh, but we have like like i said we have four or five portfolio managers in our firm that all came out of victors and some of the best i think other than other than monroe or, or roy so it's it's a it's rewarding. It's a great great group to work with. It's a wonderful you know, sort of intellectual en- environment that we have that I, I, I'm really I'm really much I'm very comfortable with. Um, when I first started, I was a little lonely. <laughs> I missed the guys at Victor's because there was a camaraderie and a, a very interesting. Uh, it was an interesting group of, of guys, and uh, luckily I've been able to bring them on as, as time has gone uh, gone by. Hey, Toby, you mentioned uh, 300 futures contracts today. And I think since we've been talking uh, some of the quant style at the longer time frame, uh, trend following models, and some of the shorter time, shorter term models, uh, for example, some of the guys that you mentioned that you, you got to know uh, from, from Victor Niederhofer's shop, the talk about the, I think there's another commonality there, which is the the liquid futures markets. So many, yeah. of the tr- so many of the traders that everyone reads about, and all the books, uh, the Market Wizards books, uh, futures trading. It was that that was the there was a tangible liquid. I mean, why don't you talk about futures trading for a second? Well, I think it, it's the most it's the most liquid markets that we can that we can we can trade, and I think that, that it's there's central clearing, there's objectivity. I think it's uh, things are. Extremely visible. We can liquidate our positions very quickly if we need to. Uh, that's that's comforting, I think, to the clients. I think a lot of the best traders started there, or they gravitated towards these are very very liquid instruments, and they, their strategies were worked around um, very liquid uh, trading instruments, and I. I think I think it's no no mistake. I mean, you think you look at you look at some of the most successful traders out there: Paul Jones, Louis Bacon, uh, Monroe, Monroe Trout. The list goes on. Paul Jones, Bruce Kovner, Jim Simon, yeah, Jim, Jim Simons, Simons, David Harding, everybody. Yeah, they trade a lot of equities, but they but that's that's an evolution. I think they started with the they started with the futures markets. In a lot of a lot of cases, so um, it's a great place to learn. It looks like there's opportunity there to a trader. I think when they first enter the trading world, you know, you're pretty so. you're a pretty ambitious guy, Toby. Uh, we we talked about that years back. Give some inspiration to people out there. I think sometimes people think that there's this tried and true method. There's this system that you can follow for life. You you know, if you just work for this guy, everything will happen. All. Uh, but as you've talked about in this conversation, it's it's not that. There's no straight line. There's no do this and you will win. But I think a lot of it, if anyone's listening to you, it's persistence. It's just drive. It's find that passion, find that calling and stick to it and know you're going to take body punches. You're going to take gut shots and it's how you pick yourself up. Well, yeah. And try, try not to get hit too hard. You know, stay in the, you stay in the game so you can learn. Um, and I, the learning process, look, we're all, we're all going to make mistakes. One of the mo- most important things for me is that I was very, I was very clear. I, I needed to learn. I needed to 
feel that I could develop and get better. So my market IQ could could expand and improve, and my understanding of the business could ex- could expand, and and I could I can get I could get better at it. It wasn't a static place for me. I think that you know, and that is that's that's what that's what has happened. Uh, I learned. And I think that we all do that. We have to know that at the beginning we don't have as much. We may be very, 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 very bright people that come to the markets. You know, I can't tell you how many PhDs in the sciences are being hired now by these firms to come in and do research. Uh, we do it ourselves. We, we really look for scientists and people that have great quantitative skills. But without market knowledge, there's you know, they don't, they don't really have anything. So that, that has to be developed and you have to be able, mastery doesn't come in, in, in a year or two. It, it's a, it's a relatively long process. It, it seems like maybe a 10 year minimum anyway. If you're going to get to a point, and by the way, I, I, I mentioned that I mastered, I don't think I've mastered this quite yet. Um, I still have more work to do. Hold on. The 25 year track record says something. It has I'm not sure bit. what, but it says something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not bad. I, I, but look, I think we're, 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 we're really just that idea of trying to improve. In order to do that, you have to be passionate about what you're doing. You really, you really have to love your work. Uh, you, it's, it, it is your passion. So without that, Without this sort of constant uh, fascination with what the market is, for me in, my, in, in this in this area, I think it's it's true in any profession. You find what you love, and be thorough about that, and then you you master it over time. And I I, I really don't you know we there are certain limitations that we have on the planet. It's wonderful what we can do as human beings. I mean, we can we can we can actually get smarter by building our pool of knowledge, make better decisions through practice. I mean, it's trading isn't much different than hitting a combination of underspin and topspin backhands. You have to hit thousands of them and you get better and better at it. That's what we do. And I, and I think that it's sort of the human condition and finding your passion and then mastering it, I think is one of the, the highest levels of, of what we do, what we humans do on the planet. So it's, uh, I hope that conveys. No, it does. Listen, I appreciate you taking the time today. I could keep you all day and just keep chit chatting about all kinds of stuff. I, I do have one kind of last, uh, last, we could keep talking, but I, I have one last thing I really kind of want to love to touch on. And you've talked a little bit about um, who you admire and some of uh, mentors. And we've talked a little bit about that. I'm curious, though, for people out there, um, trading, business, uh, philosophy, clearly you have a very strong philosophical perspective. What books do you really admire? What what have you loved to read over the decades? Well, if it's if it's about markets, I I think you you have to look at uh, Jack Schwager's Market Wizard books. I think it gives you a great view of some some really great traders. I think that that's really this inspiring stuff. Uh, reading about the the really the highest levels of the profession. Uh, I think it's really, really important. It's the inspiration, that's the food you need for to go forward. Well, I have to say, uh, Anne Rand's work, I think, the introduction to a, a, uh, the, uh, what's it, the OPAR, I think they call it, or she, they have a general text on uh, objectivist philosophy that Leonard Peikoff edited and wrote. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful book, and I think it, it gives, it gives a very clear exp- exposition of sort of the laissez-faire approach and the philosophy of, of objectivism, which I think is so helpful to, to anybody out there. What other books? Of course, I have a shrug that I thought was wonderful. I'll, I'll interject one here as we're on, along this line of thinking. I'm calling you from Saigon today. So uh, Vietnamese girlfriend, I, I bought her the other day. She speaks and reads English, but I bought her the Vietnamese version of uh, the Fountainhead, and she went through it faster than lightning. She seemed to really enjoy it. 
We have a winner there. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's a great book. If you if you get through the Fountainhead fast and you love it, I agree, right? Yeah. 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 I would also recommend Victor Hugo's work. It's just it's some of the most beautifully written stuff and inspiring things mm-hmm. that I've ever read. So, but at any rate, that's all part of our mastery is reading, reading as much as we possibly can. It's something that that's a, it may be a lost art. <laughs> you know these days but uh, with all the electronic stuff I'll still take a physical book over a Kindle any day of the week I, I don't mind searching for something on the Kindle that's great but I'd rather have the I can read faster with a physical book everyone can I would think you must be over 40 <laughs> yes <laughs> hey uh, Toby listen it was great chatting uh, hopefully we can talk again in the future sometime I'd love to have you back on we could you know just I think people are just going to enjoy this conversation Sure. Let's do. Let, we'll do ten year checkups if you want. I'll, I'll, oh, well, I'm gonna have to bring it lower to lower than ten. We can't do that. It's too long. I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here. I know you love giving some good philosophical bents, though. So, hey, people can go to check out your firm at Crable dot com. Correct. I believe that's right. Crable, Crable, something. Crable. Just they'll fig- Crable they'll figure it out. They'll You'll figure it out. Something. Yeah, yeah. They'll figure yeah. it out. They'll figure it's it out. It's not a solicitation. No, 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 no. I'm just, just informational <laughs> purposes. Uh, so uh, yeah. don't send any crazy things to Toby and all that kind of fun stuff. So buy my next book. Is one coming? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm working on it. I've got a few years into it now. So it, it should, uh, the, the former book will, will be an appendix in the new book. So because, uh, and then it will be updated. But there's there's a whole storyline on that too. The, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think I will publish something down down the road here. I'm working on it. Cool, uh, awesome. Yeah. Hey Toby, it was good chatting with you again. I appreciate you taking the time today. Thanks, Mike. Good hey, take care. To you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right Trend Following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, Trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.